This is the first of a sequence of lectures on the idea of compactness. If we begin with a finite set S, then for any map from S to the real numbers, there's always a maximum. I can always take the highest value that F takes. Our goal is to answer the rather strange question of how we could possibly ensure the same kind of thing, that is achieving a maximum value for a function, if I replace S with a topological space X. In other words, I'm going to consider myself a continuous map from X to the real numbers. And I want to know not only that the range of values that F can take is bounded, but that in fact it achieves the bounds. To ensure that, I'm going to need to require that the image of this continuous map, F of X, is a closed and bounded subset of the reals. So we're going to begin with a rather strange definition, which is the following. An open cover of X, a topological space, is a collection of open subsets, U alpha, indexed over some indexing set, such that X is actually equal to the union of these U alphas. One also says that the U alphas cover X. Okay, and so we're going to use this notion of an open cover to give ourselves a different characterization of this closed and bounded idea. Here's that characterization now. Suppose that we have ourselves a subspace of R. Then the following two conditions are equivalent. First, that X is closed and bounded as a subset of the real line. And second, that for any open cover, U alpha of our X, there exists a finite subset, A0, of the indexing set A, such that this, with only indices from the A0, is an open cover as well. The phrase that you, saw, you often see used for this <clears throat> The phrase that you often see used for this is that the U alphas for alpha in A0 is a finite subcover of the open cover U alpha. So let's prove this sentence. We want to show that closed and boundedness is equivalent to every open cover containing a finite subcover. Let's write down a proof. First things first, we want to show that if we have a closed and bounded set, then we're going to have something that has the property that every open cover has a finite subcover. And let's begin with a special case. Let's assume to start with that X is actually just a closed interval from A to B. So assume that we have U alpha, some open cover of X, and we want to try and construct a finite subcover of the U alphas. It seems very difficult to try and extract from the U alphas, given what we know, a finite subcover. So we're going to use a little trick here. And the trick we're going to use is we're going to attempt to measure our failure. And by measuring our failure, we're going to see that we succeed. <laughs> so what's the idea? So what's the idea? The idea is that we're going to take the subset of the closed interval, consisting of those points T, with the property that for some finite subset, A0 of A, AT, that closed interval, is actually covered by these U alphas, the U alphas with alpha from A0. So as soon as I just simply select an open set that contains the endpoint A, I'm going to have a finite collection of these things that's going to cover the interval from A to itself. That's a silly thing to say, but it's telling us that A is in S. In other words, this S here is a non-empty subset. And furthermore, I've defined S to be a subset of this closed interval here, so S is also a bounded subset. 
And so that means that S has a supremum, which I'll call little s. That supremum lies somewhere in the closed interval from A to B. So let's think about what happens with that supremum. Because I have an open cover, I can select some beta in A such that S is an element of U beta. So what's happening here? I have S, the supremum, and I have an open neighborhood of that supremum, which is my set U beta. And that open neighborhood has to contain some epsilon neighborhood of that supremum. I can consider the closed interval from A to S minus epsilon over 2. And since this is less than the supremum, I know that this is contained in the union of some finite collection of my U alphas. But at the same time, if I take my U beta here and add that onto that collection, then I'll have covered not only through S, but through S plus epsilon over 2. Unless, of course, S equals B. So what does that mean? That means that if S is not equal to B, then I'll have covered, using a finite collection of my U alphas, an interval that's longer than the supremum that I had. But that must mean that S plus epsilon over 2 is an element of S, and that's a contradiction. It therefore follows that S must be equal to B. So S is equal to B. And indeed, if I look at the closed interval from A to B, I can write that as a finite union of some U alphas. This is now identified for us a finite subcover of my closed interval from A to B. Now, suppose that X is some closed subset of A to B. I need to show that if I have a finite, <clears throat> I need to show that if I have an open cover, U alpha of X, then I can extract a finite subcover of this. Well, if this is an open cover of X, then these U alphas are open inside X. And so that means I can choose an open set V alpha of the closed interval such that when I intersect it with X, I get my U alpha. And I'll just do this for every single alpha in A. Now what have I got? Well, I've got myself a cover. If I take all of those elements V alpha and tack on this new element here, which is the complement of X inside the closed interval from A to B. This is now a open cover of the closed interval from A to B, and by what we've just proved, there's a finite subcover. But what's the nature of that finite subcover? Well, I can choose some finite collection of these V alphas, and of course, this element here, and that will be sure to cover my closed interval from A to B. In other words, my closed interval from A to B is the complement of X in the closed interval, union some finite collection of my V alphas. But my V alphas were chosen precisely so that when I intersect them with X, I get my U alphas. So what follows from this is that if I take this formula and intersect it with X, I arrive at X as the union of this finite collection of my U alphas. That proves that because X is closed inside the interval from A to B, any open cover of X has a finite subcover. So this now completes the proof that if you have a closed and bounded subset of the real line, then it has the property that every open cover has a finite subcover. Now let's prove the converse. We want to prove that if it's the case that every open cover has a finite subcover, then the set that we're contemplating must be closed and bounded. We'll use the contrapositive for this. First, we want to see that if we take an unbounded subset of the reals, then we can produce an open cover that doesn't have a finite subcover. How might we do that? Well, suppose that we take these open intervals of length 2, covering the entire real line, and intersect them with x. 
Since x is unbounded, then infinitely many of these are non-empty. That means that it's impossible to extract here a finite subcover. In other words, un, as n varies over all integers, is an open cover with no finite subcover. Great. That shows that if we have a set that has the property that every open cover has a finite subcover, that it will have to be a bounded set. Now let's deal with closedness. If I take a subset of the reals that is not closed, then I can begin by contemplating a point of the complement that is nevertheless close to x. After all, for x to not be closed precisely means that there's some point that's close to x that isn't in x. Now what can I do? For every epsilon greater than zero, I can intersect x with the complement of the closed interval from x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon inside the real line. Whatever this set is, it's never equal to x because little x is close to x itself. And I'm systematically excluding a little epsilon neighborhood of my little x. However, if I take the union of all of these v epsilons, then I'm taking the intersection of x with r minus x. Since x isn't in capital X, it follows that x is equal to this union. So this is an open cover, but it doesn't have any finite subcover. Because each of these is contained in the next, but at no finite stage do you actually get x itself. So this is an open cover with no finite subcover, and that shows that if x is not closed, then there's an open cover with no finite subcover, or in other words, if you have a set with the property that every open cover has a finite subcover, then that set must be closed inside the real line. This now completes the proof of the converse. A topological space X is going to be said to be compact if and only if, for every open cover, U alpha, there's a finite subcover, u alpha, where the alphas are now constrained to some finite subset of my A. And what have we just learned? We've just learned that if we have a subspace, x of r, that subspace will be compact if and only if it is both closed and bounded. So today we're going to be looking at a lot of different theorems about compactness. But the first one is that compactness behaves in the same way that connectedness did in the following sense, in the sense that if you have a continuous map f from x to y, and if that map is actually a surjection, then if x is compact, so is y. In other words, the continuous image of a compact space is compact. This is analogous to the theorem that we learned at the very beginning of the semester that the continuous image of a connected space is connected. Let's prove this. We'll begin with an open cover u alpha of y and we're going to try to extract a finite subcover of that open cover. So x is compact, but we don't know about y yet, and we're trying to prove that. Well, what can we do with this open cover? I can't think of anything except to just take the inverse image of each of these opens underneath my continuous map. And if I do that, all of these will be open, and they'll certainly cover my x, so this will be an open cover of x. Now, x is compact, so that means that there's a finite subset, a0 of a, such that the f inverse u alphas with alpha in A0 is an open cover. Okay, so let's just consider the u alphas that came with that index, the index alpha in A0. If I union them together, 
then I can notice that because f is a surjection, u alpha is equal to the image of the inverse image of u alpha. Here I'm using critically that f is a surjection. Now the union of the direct image, that's just the direct image of the unions. And so here I'm taking the image of the union of these inverse images. But we just said that this is an open cover. So that means that this is simply x. But now I'm looking at the image of x, and because f is a surjection, that's precisely y. But that means that I've produced a subcover which is finite of my existing cover. Here's an immediate corollary of that. Let's suppose that I have a compact topological space X and I have a continuous map from X to the real line. Then this map will have to achieve both a maximum and a minimum. Why is that? Well, the image of this map will have to be a compact subspace of R, but we've seen that compact subspaces of R are precisely those spaces that are closed and bounded. So that means that the image is going to be a closed and bounded subset of R. The supremum of that image is actually contained in that image, so there's a maximum, and the infimum of that image is contained in that image, so that there's a minimum. Good, so now we've understood what compact subspaces of R are. And we'd like to be able to say the same basic idea will work for if I replace R with Rn. In order to do that, we need to build up a little bit of a better understanding of how compact topological spaces work. So let's use a few lemmas to give ourselves some intuition about how these things work, and we're going to see how to construct new compact topological spaces from old compact topological spaces. The first one is something that we've already seen in the case of the real line. If you have a closed subspace Z of a compact topological space, then that Z is also compact. And this proof is just the proof that we saw in the world of the real line, if we have an open cover of Z, then we'll choose some V alphas inside X that are open, whose intersection with Z gives us these U alphas. And we'll do that for every alpha in A. Now, because X is compact, there's a finite subset, A0 of A, such that X can be covered by the complement of Z along with some finite collection of these V alphas. And once again, by intersecting this formula with Z, I see that Z can be written as a finite union of the U alphas, and so I've got my finite subcover. So that's an operation we can do. We can always pass to a closed subset. Now I want to argue that not only can we pass to a closed subset, but we can also pass to products of compact topological spaces. To prove that, I need access to a little lemma which is often called the tube lemma. Here it is. Suppose that I have some topological spaces, x and y. And let's assume that the second of these, y, is compact. Now if I look at some open subset of the product of x and y, then I might be inclined to look at the set of points of x with the property that x comma y for any element of y is contained in w. This set is then open in x. So let's have a look at the picture of it. So here's x, and we're crossing that with y, so we get this nice rectangle here. And y is compact, so I've drawn it in this kind of short way here. I'm interested in the collection of those points of x such that when you look at little x cross y, which is a copy of y sitting inside x cross y, that that is completely contained in my open subset w. So here I've drawn some crazy looking open subset w, and I'm looking for points of x with the property that this entire slice sits entirely inside W. 
The claim is that the collection of those is open in X. And here we're critically going to be using the compactness of Y. What does that mean? That means that, for example, I should imagine that if I can embed one of these slices, then I can find a little neighborhood such that I can embed the entire slice over all the points of that neighborhood completely inside my W. And that's the thing we're going to prove. So suppose that I have a point X of U. Now for every single point along this slice, I can write a neighborhood that looks like a box, by which I mean it looks like a neighborhood of X cross a neighborhood of Y. And I can arrange for that box to be entirely contained in my W. That's because I know that the product X cross Y has a base consisting of boxes. That is to say, consisting of open subsets of X crossed with open subsets of Y. So for each of these points, I can draw a box that is completely contained inside my open set W. So that's just what I'll do. For every point Y of Y, I'm going to choose an open neighborhood UY of X and an open neighborhood VY of Y, such that when I product them together, I get something that's completely contained inside my W. Now, if I think about it, I'm choosing all of my Ys. So certainly, if I take the intersection of these products with this slice, X cross Y, that's going to give me an open cover of X cross Y. But X cross Y is homeomorphic to Y itself. And so that's compact. What does that guarantee? That guarantees that for some finite set, y1 through yn of points of y, I can write this slice as a subset of a finite union of these boxes inside my w. So here, for example, I have four such points. And the claim is that I can draw boxes around these points in such a way as to ensure that the entire slice is contained in the union of that finite collection of boxes. And that moreover, those boxes are all contained in my W. So these boxes come in varying widths. I'm going to take the smallest of those widths. In other words, I'm going to take the intersection of all those widths. And that's going to give me a open subset of U, because after all, this is a finite intersection. Notice that this is where I'm really using the compactness. I extracted this finite set using the compactness of Y, and that gave me a finite collection of opens that I could then intersect and could still be assured that I have an open set. So now I'm intersecting this finite list of open sets together, and I'm getting an open neighborhood of X that's completely contained in my U. But that's just what I wanted to prove. I wanted to prove that U is open, and I've just proven that every point of U has a little open neighborhood that's completely contained in U. So this now proves the tube lemma, which is the statement that this U here, the set of points such that the corresponding slice is completely contained in W, that set is open in X. We're now going to use the tube lemma to prove the product lemma. If we have a finite collection of compact topological spaces, then their product is also compact. 
There's a stronger statement, which is that if you have any collection of any size of compact topological spaces, then their product is also compact. That's called the Tikhonov theorem, and that's a much harder sentence than what we're proving today. What we're proving today is focused entirely on the question of finite products of compact topological spaces. So how does the proof go? Well, it suffices for us to prove that if we have two compact topological spaces X and Y, then their product is also compact. So let's do it. Let's consider an open cover W alpha of the product. And for every point, little x of x, I can look at this corresponding slice, x cross y, which is guaranteed to be compact, and so can therefore be covered by finitely many of the w alpha. So we'll let a sub x be a finite subset such that this slice is contained in the union of the w alphas over that finite subset. And we're simply going to define a of x for every single point of x. Now on the other hand, we can look at the collection of points of x with a property that the slice is completely contained in the union of these w alphas over a x, this finite subset. If we call this set u x, then the tubulum is telling us that this is an open set. So I have an open set, ux, for every single point of x. This is actually an open neighborhood of little x, because after all, little x is in this set by design. And so these uxs together are giving me an open cover of x. Now I'm entitled to find a finite subcover, because after all, x is compact. So I can choose a finite set, x1 through xm, of points such that the uxis form an open cover of x. So now I can take these finite sets, the axis, and union them all together. This is a finite union, so I end up with a finite set, a0. And what's true about this finite set? Well, if I look at the union of all the w alphas, that's the same thing as the union over all i's of the union over all alphas in Axi of these w alphas. And by design, each of these must contain uxi cross y. But these uxi's form an open cover of x, so if I union all of them together, I must be getting x itself. When I product that with y, then I'm just getting x cross y. And so I've extracted here a finite subcover of the open cover that I had of x cross y. That proves that if I have a finite collection of compact topological spaces, their product is again compact. Good, now we've developed a collection of lemmas that we can put together to prove a theorem. And this is called the heine borel theorem. The statement is that the following are equivalent for a subspace X of Euclidean space. First, that X is closed and bounded. And second, that X is compact. Let's prove this, and we'll begin by trying to prove that 1 implies 2. So if X is closed and bounded, then that means that it's a closed subset of some box, a product of closed intervals. Now the product lemma tells us that this is compact. And by the closed subspace lemma, every closed subspace of this box is also compact. But that's the proof. That's everything there. Any closed and bounded subset of Euclidean space must be compact because of these two lemmas. Great. Now conversely, let's prove that 2 implies 1.
Well, the fact that if we have a compact subspace of Euclidean space, then it must be closed, follows exactly as in the proof in the real line. That was the proof, remember, that showed that if you had something that wasn't closed, and you took a point that was close to it but not contained in it, then you could construct an open cover that had no finite subcover. Okay, well now how will we see that x here has to be bounded? Well, what does it mean for x to be bounded? It means that it has to be bounded in each direction. Well, if I consider the image of my compact x under the various projection maps, PRK, those will all have to be compact subspaces of the real line. But the compact subspaces of the real line are definitely bounded. Therefore, it follows that the image, all of these images are bounded, which means that X itself is bounded. So now we have this rather abstract notion of compactness, which we can now relate to quite a concrete notion in the case of subspaces of Euclidean space. So let's see some examples. Well, the spheres, every sphere is a compact space. And we saw how to construct the real and complex projective spaces as quotients of spheres. What does that mean? That means that we have a surjective continuous map from some sphere to PNR, and we have a surjective continuous map from another sphere to PNC. Since continuous images of compact spaces are compact, it follows that these two are compact. The torus, the torus, remember, is simply the circle across the circle. The circle is compact, and finite products of compact spaces are compact, and so that means that our torus is compact. The Cantor space, C, is compact. Remember, we could write down the Cantor space C as a closed subset of the real line. And that closed subset is bounded. It's completely contained in the closed interval from 0 to 1. Therefore, this is a closed and bounded subset of the reals, and therefore it too is compact. And finally, any topology on a finite set is always compact. Indeed, any open cover of a finite topological space is necessarily always finite, and so there's really nothing to say here.